So now I'm really excited to introduce our first panel of the morning on an issue that I care very deeply about, and I think everyone in this room does, packaging. And to address this topic, I'd like to invite our panelists, Deanna Cohen, Jeff Yorzik, and Camille Herrera, to join me on stage, please. Let me just introduce you quickly to all of them. Deanna is the co-founder of the Plastic Pollution, Plastic Pollution Coalition, excuse me, and such a great leader on all of these issues, so thank you for your work. We have Jeff Yorzik, the Senior Director of Sustainability for HelloFresh. He's one of those people Marion was talking about who have really hard jobs. Um, and we have Camille Herrera, the Packaging Development and Sustainability Manager with Driscoll's, also a very hard job. So give them a round of applause for joining, please. So, Deanna, I've known you for a long time. I'm sorry you don't have a mic. Hi. Um, and, and you have created this expansive network of nonprofits who are really concerned about, you know, not just reducing plastics, but eliminating them. And, I, I, you know, to reduce the waste that goes into our oceans, our rivers, just on the land in general. As, as the coalition, as the Plastic Pollution Coalition has grown, what do you see as the biggest opportunities for progress? One of the things that I've seen you do is be really involved with the Google Food Lab. Yeah, so we, we've had amazing opportunities. Um, I'm actually blown away by how much it's grown. I, I have to do a shout out though to Marion for a minute and just say thank you for you know, taking all of, the, all of your work on. And I think something my father said to me recently when our work was attacked, he said, you know you're being effective when people attack you. And that made me feel kind of proud, actually, of the work that we're doing. So you know you're being effective. Um, so we were co-founded in 2009. And it took about eight years for us to shift language, and I'm talking about political language as well, uh, to using the term plastic and plastic pollution in place of Marine debris, debris, litter, huh. rubbish, waste, and garbage. Yeah. And these are all terms that continue to be uplifted. You'll see new big multi-billion dollar groups that have been created by the petrochemical and the plastic industry to continue using language that is distractive, sure. I would say, or that waters down the issue. So that would be one of the first things that I think we did that was the most effective. The coalition has grown from our first year to we're now over, we're just over 1,400 organizations and businesses from mm -hmm. 75 different countries around the world. Wow. Yeah, and everyone is using this Congratulations. Thank you, thanks. Well, I think what it shows and there's been a big uptick in the last four years in businesses joining our coalition. Huge uptick. We're now over 650 businesses. And businesses, some of them are small, some of them are medium-sized. They're all trying to scale, but they're offering alternative materials to single-use plastics. Right. And I think it's really important to say, just in case people are not aware, 99% of the plastics that we use and the plastic we use for food packaging and beverage packaging is made from fossil fuels. It's made from... Coal, gas, fracked gas, oil, cracked gas. And it is really, really bad for our health. And it bites us on the butt, literally the entire chain of manufacture from extraction through production, manufacturing. Our use, if it's designed for single use, we use it for a very short amount of time. And then instantly, it's a waste management issue. And that's generally buried in our environment, which we call landfilling or it's burnt in some way. And we call that lots of euphemistic terms like waste to energy, waste to sure. fuel. Basically, it's incinerated. And when we look at that entire chain, the facilities for all of that are generally located in low income, rural communities, communities of color, brown communities, black communities, indigenous communities. And we're also poisoning ourselves. So. I, c I can talk about this for a week Absolutely. straight. Back to you. Oh, I, I will talk about the Google Food Lab for a minute if you want me to. Please, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So the Google Food Lab, we had this opportunity to present a few years ago. That was turned into an accelerator. We then, it went into four different versions of the accelerator and we created a tool that is free for everyone to use. It's called the Understanding Packaging Scorecard, upscorecard.org. We created it with uh, representatives from Composite Google, Sodexo, Aramark, Subway, um, with, uh, in Switzerland, the, 
I'm forgetting the name of the organization, I'll remember in a minute, Jane Munke's organization, Food Packaging Forum, that's what they're called, and Plastic Pollution Coalition. And we've created a free tool that is available to everyone that looks at six different specific attributes, including the impact to climate, toxins, so, so not toxins, toxics, and plastic pollution. And we're really proud of that tool, and we hope that you will all find it useful in your work. You no, know, and it was so exciting to watch it grow in the Google Food Lab and see how it progressed. So thank you for that. Yeah. And you brought up this really interesting issue of semantics and language that I want to come back to you all later about. So sure. Je Jeff and Camille, uh, you know, I, I'm hoping you can both talk about why it's important to have businesses taking the lead on this issue of, of plastic waste and packaging in general. And, and how can policymakers and nonprofit organizations like Diana's and mine help support those efforts in a way that's not greenwashing your companies? I mean, you're still run company, or you're still part of companies, and, and, but a lot needs to be done. And if companies don't take the lead, this is going to be very difficult. So I don't know which one of you wants to go first. I can go ahead and start. Um, it's really important to have companies be involved in this because they understand the ecosystems in which they operate. Sure. And if you don't understand the ecosystem in which you're, you're operating, then you can have good intentions, but they might have negative consequences. Sure, sure. And so um, businesses have the ability to make connections, um, whether it's working with NGOs, um, whether it's working with your local government, um, state government, federal government to um, help everybody understand the ecosystem that, that the operations are happening in and where the disconnects are uh -huh. and where the connections can be made for improvement. Yeah, yeah. Jeff? Um, yeah, so from the HelloFresh perspective, I would say um, one of the first things that you do is you're putting pressure on this, on this subject, which is incredibly important. Um, without pressure, we won't have a lot of incentive to change. Our customers won't be pushing us to change. Uh, and frankly, our regulators won't be pushing sure. us to change. And so there is always that, that ecosystem of, of groups that need to come together in terms of individuals, governments, and corporations to really drive long-lasting change. Um, so I think those are, those are where I think organizations like yours really help us. Because um, to Marion's point, I, I, I am one of those individuals that sits in a sustainability position inside a company uh, and continues to push that rock uphill every single day. Sure. And aren't you going to a, a packaging conference right after this? I will be at a packaging conference in Atlanta tomorrow. Yeah, and these things are important for companies to talk to one another about. They're important for, for all of us to be aware of. I mean, I think the pandemic, you know, so much progress was made and then we kind of went backward. And, can, can, you know, maybe you can all address this. How can we sort of get the gains that we made back, you know, that were made before two, two, 2000, before 2020? I've lost all sense of time. But, but before 2020, so much change was happening and then it all sort of went, mm. went out the door. So I will, I'm holding the mic, so I'll start us off. Um, yeah, from our perspective, it hasn't really changed, the, the velocity of change hasn't, hasn't changed that much for us. Um, honestly, prior to pandemic, uh, we were working on packaging. I, as far as I'm concerned, we'll be working on packaging 20 years from now. Sure. Um, I think it will be a continuous improvement um, exercise that we will continue to work on. Sure. Um, I mean, meal kits, you know, 10 years ago, we all heard about this company called Blue Apron. Right. We didn't really know what it was. Um, and so the industry's 10 years old. When we first hit the market, we essentially went to the big packaging players and they essentially offered what they had and we had right. to figure out how to make that work. Um, and it's only really been within the last five years or so we've had a number of suppliers really come to us and want to work through like what is really unique about a meal kit, uh, how do we actually design packaging for that, how do we think differently about packaging. Um, we've had some great folks and we've, we've tiered what we've done. So some of these pieces like the insulation inside the box, um, you know, phasing out especially EPS foam uh, or styrofoam for everybody. Um, you know, there's some other plastics that are, that are very large in that, um, that are not recyclable items. Um, some people claim they're recyclable falsely, um, which also hurts the industry. Sure. Um, but really working with our suppliers to make sure we're, we're moving through those and some awesome, like there's this one specific supplier who actually came up with like a cornstarch foam between two pieces of paper, which is a fantastic uh, substitute for styrofoam. So it's really working through it item by item for us. Absolutely. Um, so, but groups like you keep pressure on it such that we see like the packaging conference I will go to, uh, sustainable packaging conference um, next week. Um, you know, the different manufacturers are there. So Futamura, who makes um, cellulose-based plastic, 
uh, that's backyard compostable, um, you know, they, they will be there and we need more companies like that. Sure. But until, you know, it's that entrepreneurial equation, well, until there's a little bag of money there and something to figure out to get to it, nobody's going to figure out how to get to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Deanna, how, how do we, first of all, did we lose a lot of, of progress during the pandemic? Am I wrong? Mm, I don't know if we lost progress. I think what happened is it, I think industry used it as an excuse to mm. put a kibosh on all the policy and legislation that had been passed. So things were frozen. Sure. Um, the implementation of bag bans of different kinds of single use plastic bans, were, those were those were stunted. Sure. But I think what we also saw, and pretty much everyone I know experienced, is a huge uptick in plastic pollution and garbage all around us, right. in our neighborhoods, <laughs> wherever we live. And this, you know, realizing we were also creating a huge amount from, you know, COVID tests to masks, single use masks to gloves, et cetera. Um, and so I think that that was very effective and it reawakened people to the problem. Right. Um, but I would say that, you know, we're, we're back on track now, Good. that we're coming out the other end of, of the pandemic, hopefully, this winter. Knock on wood. <laughs> Didn't have <laughs> researchers. But um, with regards to other materials, it, I've been saying to everyone for a long time, and we're for, in our 14th year, it's so exciting. It's like the wild, wild west or something. I grew up in California, so, you know, I'm very kind of aligned with that, that image. It's, it's the wild, wild west if you're an entrepreneur and you've got um, an existing material. It doesn't have to be a new material, just a new design, a new systems way of using it. It can be anything from glass to, <laughs> you know, food grade steel to plant-based materials or plates. Um, we're seeing a lot of interesting work being done with mushrooms, mushroom mycelium, algae, seaweed. I love mycelium, it's so cool. It's so <laughs> cool. I mean, Ecovative, Sway, Lollyware, all these different companies, and then a lot of interesting stuff happening in the food, um, food, you know, with regards to how we package food, and then also in beauty and health, in terms of people understanding the value of packaging something in glass, but that needs to be supported with the systems that I'm in my 50s and I remember when everything was in glass and you really treasured those glass bottles and they had value and you returned them and they were sterilized and refilled locally. We need to invest in these sure. kinds of infrastructures that support reuse and refill and value materials. So like I'm looking forward to moving even beyond aiming for zero waste but moving to a world with 100% valuable materials yeah, where yeah. we become like nature and we we think ahead and okay. the way we design things so it's 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 exciting time you guys i'm excited about all of it it is exciting yeah. Camille, I have talked to Driscoll's a lot about packaging, and I know you have tried like different things to um, you know showcase your berries in a way that would make it easier for for customers to either recycle them or compost them but customers didn't like it. So you went from these clamshells that were clear, like the ones you see at Whole Foods, to you know, brown paper ones where people couldn't see the berries. And, and that caused a lot, of, I think it caused food waste, it caused people not to buy them. Well, how do you sort of deal with these, these different things of what customers say they want, what eaters like me say they want, and then what happens when they're at the grocery store? Thanks for that question. That is something that we grapple with on a, on a daily basis. And so, um, there's kind of a, a threefold strategy that we have. Um, the first thing I just wanted to share is that berry packaging in the United States contains the highest one of the highest percentages of recycled content of any food package in the US. Um, berry packaging okay. contains over 50% recycled content. Um, so those, those PET clamshells are you know, doing their best to minimize their impact. And a lot of my work has been on clamshell to clamshell recycling. Um, so there has historically not been a market for PET clamshells the way there has been for bottles because of things like bottle beverage programs. You know, PET clamshells have gained in prevalence in the last couple of years and our waste recovery system has not been prepared to deal with them the same way they deal with bottles. So a lot of my work has been doing that and we're really happy to share that last year in 2021, 9% of our recycled content came directly from PET thermoforms. So we're really working on leading the packaging industry, leading the produce industry in how do we recover these packages so it is closed loop and they're not, um, 
ending up in the landfill. And then the second uh, way we're going about it is um, how do we transition the consumer? Right, the consumer right. says they want uh, fi fiber-based packaging, um, but then again, there's the issue of seeing the berries. People buy produce with their eyes. You look in your fridge for produce with your eyes. Sure. And so if there isn't that connection, um, it, it does make our job a lot harder. Sure. And so we're looking at hybrid packages where you have a base that's, that's fiber, a lid that's clear. Um, and so that's, you know, we're gonna, we've already released one into the market, uh -huh. very small, and we've got another one coming up uh, later this year, early next year. And so kind of helping consumers make that adjustment sure. um, is one thing. And then I'd say the third strategy is that, you know, plastic pollution is a huge issue. Unfortunately, it's not the only one we're facing. And so a lot of my work is life cycle assessments, uh -huh. is I'm weighing, you know, what is the greenhouse gas impact of this? What's the water impact? What's the water quality impact? Um, and we think about all those things. And so uh, it's continuing materials testing, um, working with our post-harvest teams, right. um, even the harvesters, right? Like the package, right. we have to think about how easy it is for them to pack the berries, um, how, is it, is it one touch? You know, are right. they having to move more? Time is money, so the more time you spend opening and closing and preparing a package is the less time you're putting berries into that package. Sure, sure. And so um, we're just continually testing and keeping an eye out for new materials. I'm, I'm always watching out for things that will work with our supply chain, and that's where we're at today. Yeah, it, it's a huge journey to embark on to, to really change this. And we talked about semantics before, and maybe this ties into it, but Mary and I were talking a lot about policy. Policy needs to change to help companies and nonprofits do this work. And I'm wondering what sort of policy changes you all want to see on this, this front of packaging. <laughs> How much time do we have? <laughs> Five minutes. <laughs> um, I'm really looking forward to seeing how um, some really big packaging policy was passed in California. Uh -huh. um, and that's you know, going to be looked at for a, a long time by other states. So um, it, it establishes a, um, a extended producer responsibility. So the idea that we've been talking about, that uh, companies you know, get involved with what happens to their packages at the end of life. Sure. Um, and so I think that that's helpful when there's an even playing field for holding companies accountable. Uh -huh. um, so I really am looking forward to seeing more connections um, between, you know, what's happening on the ground level for consumers and then what happens to those packages at, at end of life. Sure, sure. Great. Thank you so much. Diana. Yeah, so obviously we're incredibly excited about the 40 different bills that Governor Newsom signed into law. They're all environmental bills and they have to do with extended producer responsibility, but also measurably reducing single-use plastic and not drilling more for oil right. in California. So all these things are interconnected. I think I said that in the beginning. Um, but I'm also really excited at the federal level about the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, which is uh, a very expansive piece of federal legislation. Uh, of course, at this point in time, it only has support from progressive Democrats, <laughs> and, but I'd like to see more people step up who begin to understand the connection between the impact to human health and animal health and our waterways, our soil, the air we breathe, et cetera, and the impact from plastics and single-use plastics and plastic fibers, microplastics. So I'm really excited about all of that. And then also at the international level, we, um, the uh, EU has passed a very substantial piece of legislation phasing out single-use plastics, and so all the companies that are based out of the European Union are going to have to meet that criteria, but we're also working on developing and drafting a um, global plastic treaty through UNEA. I love so it. it's really exciting, and again, it's really exciting because we're calling it plastic, and we're calling it plastic pollution, and we know what we're dealing with. So nice. I'm nice. excited about all those things. Yeah. Thank you so sure. much. Jeff, last word. So I have one thing to add. Uh-huh. National recycling strategy. Please. Yes, bravo. Really needed. Um, you know, there are some groups out there that are really trying to figure out how do we standardize recycling, how do we make this simpler for the consumer, um, but just reducing the chaos to it. Because so uh, I mean, across the 15 yeah. countries we do business in, like every single country has different recycling, but in the US it's, it's 
municipal level. It's even within your town, it depends on your, your carrier. Um, and that really just hamstrings any kind of design process to try and create something that's really gonna move through that system in an effective way. Right, right. Thank you all so much. Let's give this uh, panel a round of applause, please. Thank you.